Um, I'm a visual artist and I'm taking over the whole artistic vision of this event. So the lines that you see out there, I was on my knees placing those lines all week. Um, I hope you're enjoying it. Um, as a visual artist, I entered the blockchain space in 2018 because I was uh, commissioned as artwork by Trubit uh, to represent the blockchain. I make these large scale installations. I don't do any computer work. I work with my hands, but I'm interested in bringing a vision of what the digital space may look like, even though everything is handmade. Are we good there? So, uh, we have a maker space on the sixth floor. So please follow the purple line all the way there. I want to give a shout out to our maker space um, participants. So we have Evan in the back. He's doing uh, hardware workshops. So if you guys are interested in playing with data, Arduinos, Raspberry Pis, mix it with art, put it up on the walls. We have an active space for experimentation. Um, and then I have uh, my panelists here. Um, we, have, we have you here. Can you please stand up? Thank you. I worked with this person all week. It's amazing to see this, this collaboration. All right. So, uh, we have physical art, but then we have art on the blockchain. So, my introduction comes from the physical art, but my guests um, come from putting art on the blockchain, from different blockchains, actually. Um, I want to bring the conversation a little bit on the broader scale, on the broader spectrum, uh, from counterparty to Bitcoin to Ethereum, and kind of discuss a little bit what, what it is that can happen between blockchains and using NFTs. So, in my opinion, uh, art is kind of at the front lines of blockchain adoption if we see it um, actively. We, we see a really active community of artists. And um, I kind of want to enhance and talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm going to give the mic to each one of you. Uh, please introduce yourselves. And then I'll, I'll ask the first question, okay? Uh, Gus, do you want to start over there? Uh, sure. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Gus. Uh, I've been playing around with NFTs since 2016, before it was even a thing. Uh, we started tokenizing on Counterparty back, back in the day. And uh, we definitely uh, see the demand for interoperability between blockchains. So we are trying to develop a protocol. Uh, there are different approaches for this. So creating tokens on one, on blockchain A, and being able to create sub-assets in blockchain B, that's, that could be a, a, way, a way to go. There are, I've heard in this, same, uh, in, in this same event other proposals, very interesting, that we can go through with more time. But yeah, I, feel, I definitely think that the digital art uh, is gonna move in a, in a, in a very important way into, into crypto collectibles and uh, scarce digit, digital files. All right, first I just want to say thank you, Jessica, for having us up, and thanks to the ETH Denver team for organizing such an awesome event. Uh, my name is John Crane. I work on SuperRare, and SuperRare is a community and platform for digital artists and collectors. Um, so we're built on top of Ethereum, big fans of all the work on Counterparty and Bitcoin that came before uh, what, we were, what we're doing now and what we drew a lot of inspiration from. And yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you also, Jessica. My name is Alex Atala. I'm the CTO and co-founder of OpenSea, which is a marketplace for crypto collectibles. So you can see what you own without logging in, sell, and buy from new collections that pop up every week. So we started with the classic uh, first collectible game item, CryptoKitties, and that one kind of fell after the initial art projects that inspired the space, um, including Rare Pepe and Counterparty, and also CryptoPunks. So we've seen game items pop up, but also uh, art assets evolve over time. And I think it's really exciting because it's a great way for any new industry to start. If you look at like all the, 
almost every major consumer company, it started as like a toy or as uh, like a not serious enterprise app. Like Facebook started as hot or not. Apple started as a computer kit for hobbyists. And I think blockchain could very well start with art because it's so incredibly easy to trade. You don't have to know anybody. It's not a who's who. It's just, here's the content. Do you want to buy it? Hi, my name is Theo Goodman, and I'm from the Rare Pepe Foundation, which started back in the dark ages of crypto in late 2016, where we were making art tokens on the Bitcoin blockchain. And uh, yeah, I'm also with Elevated Games and NIM right now, and I'm also an assassin for hire. And uh, yeah, I think that uh, art uh, definitely ha will always have a future in, uh, you know, Bitcoin, blockchain, whatever you want to call it, because humans like to collect things. That's just like what we do. You go out, collector gatherer, go get berries and stuff, bring it back to the cave and show everybody what you've collected. And uh, that's the same thing. We like to collect stuff. Actually, what it is, is there's not a big difference from collecting different crypto coins as there are different NFTs. Because in the end, it's, it's a very similar experience. Okay, if you open your Bitcoin wallet, you have a big B, the big B Bitcoin logo. Or if you open your Ethereum wallet, you have the big Ethereum logo. And it says how many you have. And an NFT is very similar. It's like, oh, I have the rare Pepe, and how many do I have? When, and it shows you a picture of it. So really, it's very similar to that, except it's just resting on another blockchain. So humans in general like to do things like gambling, collect things, trade, make money, etc. And so that's one of the reasons that this is so appealing. Hello, my name is James Cantre, um, and I, I've got invited here as a collector of NFTs. I have my project on the sixth floor. Um, I hope that I can see you all, all over there. It's called Our Lady of Crypto, or La Virgen del Crypto, and everything started having a conversation with my friend Carlos, and we were talking how every Hispanic country has its own representation of the Virgin Mary, and as a joke, we were saying like, oh, very soon we will need um, our own Virgin Mary on the virtual world. So we created this avatar that is called Our Lady of Crypto, and um, basically this avatar collects NFTs with religious themes. And the whole, the whole project is up an exploration of the intersection between art, crypto, and religion. Because as you may know, people in blockchain, they also have these kind of like fetish objects that they venerate. And it's very interesting to explore how we get mixed with the NFT world. Um, yeah, and that connects right with uh, what Theo was saying about collecting and acquiring. Um, so I want to pick your, your brain, Goose. Um, you started in Counterparty. We're talking about different blockchains. We're talking about these collectibles that are somehow locked in places, whether it is um, um, on, an, on your platform or OpenSea can be kind of a bridge between. But if I have, for example, uh, on Artolin, which is your project, and I have my token or I have my NFT that I buy in your uh, platform. Uh, for example, I have another one in Super Rare. I know that OpenSea may be the sort of uh, window for me to see them both at the same time in this other place, which I find interesting to have OpenSea here because of, we want to we want to talk about this cross um, cross token flow. Like I want to pick your brain on that. Uh, I know that you have a project that you're trying to bring tokens from Counterparty to Ethereum. Tell us about that process, how you're envisioning, what is the technology behind perhaps reaching this goal? Sure. Uh, well, I think that because this is, uh, we're on we are a very early stage of all this ecosystem, most people, even most people in, in these kind of events, don't understand the nature of, of the token itself yes. and the differences between those tokens. Uh -huh. So uh, the more people learn about the details, we will find better and better collectibles. Because uh, the same as with money, not all collectibles are the same. So if we go back in history, as Theo was mentioning, and you see the first collectibles in, in, in the records, we'll see that it's not the same 
uh, to collect a stone or a shell or a little piece of, of gold, right? So it's a little bit the same with, with the digital world. The digital scarcity is not going to be the same depending on the quality of the token. So we believe that the more people uh, start understanding the, the nature of the token, they will tend to collect the better tokens. So we are focusing on that. We want to craft the best tokens, and not all tokens are the same. So for instance, going back to your question, like what happens if I have tokens on one blockchain and I realize that there are better tokens on other blockchains? I would like to make sub-assets on that other blockchain maybe, or try to send or block or burn my tokens on one blockchain in order to recreate them in another one, preserving both scarcity and, uh, and uh, durability, which is important, right? So that's one of the main focus of the project. It's called Artolin. We have a really cool stand on the, on the makerspace with yes. AR, so you can visualize it better. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, so before coming down here, we're just talking about art as this sort of experimental uh, way of playing with blockchain. There's really not an end to this that requires um, to total, total precision, let's say. Uh, we in the art and blockchain space give ourselves uh, the opportunity to experiment. How do you guys see, whoever wants to answer the question, these, this experimentation that is taking place in the art and blockchain space to have an impact in other realms of the blockchain arena? Does that make sense? Sure, yeah, I think like, one of the things that I think is the biggest benefit is just like, it's all a public data set. I think that's far as like, if you look at markets and especially like the art market, it's all closed data. You need subscriptions to run queries on it. And so regardless of the chain you're working on or what you're doing, we're creating a public data set about art, which is super interesting and has never happened before uh, historically. And so I think that's a huge benefit for the artists and collectors. So like, I can see like in the future, if people do want to move the token across chains, this uh, probably will be totally possible. Mm -hmm. And like the biggest benefit is just, we have a public record, we can know like, okay, this uh, certified RP started over here, it moved over here. And the biggest benefit is just having this uh, publicly shared data set about the experimentation that people are doing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. That kind of reminds me, one of the hardest things to explain to people who are new to the space is this total shift that happened, where normally digital things advertise physical things. Like if I have a physical piece of art, I'll like email a photo of it to someone, or you can look up photos online, and the photos advertise the digital good. But I own a physical shirt with a Josie Bellini painting on it. And that physical shirt is really easy to copy. And there's like tons of physical, like Josie Bellini paintings. There's one on the sixth floor um, where you can use uh, Gus's app to kind of uh, add augmented reality on top of it. The physical things are now advertising for the digital goods. It completely flipped. And it's hard for people to understand that, but it makes it really easy for collectors and really easy for people to discover uh, so there art. Is still the this tie that we have to the physical world in order to access and understand and have this impact, I, I suppose. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I still love the physical stuff. Like, I like my shirt that I have with her painting on it. But, but the real value that's going to stay forever, like, that's never going to get destroyed, that doesn't deteriorate, that doesn't, um, that, that's very easy for other people to access and buy, is not the shirt. And that's like very interesting once you see collectors buying back and forth. Alex, and can you tell me more about the different kind of um, goods that are on OpenSea and like how can you compare the behavior of the ones that are artistic versus the other ones? Yeah, so I'd say there's three main types of goods right now. There's game items, which are probably the majority of OpenSea. And some games are like CryptoKitties, which are kind of collectible games like Neopets. And some games are like Neon District, which are more interactive, like role-playing games. Um, we see card, like card games like Gods Unchained. Okay. All of those game items also have their own art associated with each game token. We, second type is uh, 
names, the digital like indicators of digital property. So there are coordinates that you can buy that represent a property inside VR, okay. um, like Decentraland or CryptoVoxels. I think we have Jim back there who uh, works on a lot of builds there and ENS names, like wallet names. And the last bit is art. And art's kind of like the steady holdout. And we just see like giant spikes every time an artist figures out a new type of uh, niche to go after and double down on. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say, as far as the, uh, you were talking about different tokens on different blockchains and how yes. do you, it really, you also have to think about what do you want to do? Because if you just, if it's for a game, let's say it's for a game, you don't need to change the blockchain to do the game. It could have a game with that uses some tokens for Bitcoin and some tokens for ETH. You could just, uh, you know, just sign so, sign something from an address that proves you have ownership at least at that time. So you could definitely integrate things into a game um, using several tokens from different blockchains. You could also do that for a really simple app, for example, just like my collection. And I could have okay, I've got my collection. I can show you know, all the ones I have on Ethereum and all the ones I have on Bitcoin, and all the ones I have on EOS and all the ones I have on Theo's blockchain and so on. And that wouldn't be that hard to do. But what's not trivial to do is to do really say, I want to erase, so I have a token called Theo's because it's like EOS but better. And it's on, <laughs> it's on Bitcoin. So if I want to erase all 90, 999 of those and put them on Ethereum, well, that would be not really trivial to do, but I could do it um, if I used it a trusted third party. I could say, hey, Gus, I'm going to send you all of my Theos, and you burn them, and tell everyone you did it, and uh, we all verify that. Now, I think if we do that, we should have, like, a burning ritual and make it, like, a really big thing. Because, like, in, in Rare Pepe Chat, before we did an auction, we used to sacrifice Pepe Cash to Lord Keck and send Pepe Cash to a burn address. And I think that's a, that's a cool way to do it. I mean, we're doing art and NFTs. Well, let's do that. So if anyone wants to transfer any of their Ethereum NFTs to Bitcoin or the other way around, then uh, just talk to me and I'll decimate and destroy them and tell everyone I did and then we'll generate a new one. Very interesting. Um, and uh, Theo, um, can, you, can you point out any sort of big flaw that you think needs attention in this NFT art blockchain world? Hmm, a big flaw? Well, it's, it's just, it's not that there is necessarily flaws, there's just trade-offs on what you want to do. So, you know, so for example, um, you know, I think that right now most of the NFT contracts are, you know, audited, they've been used a lot, there's not gonna be like some kind of hidden bug in them, but that could happen if you're using a, a newer kind of contract, for example. Yes, yeah, so you have to decide. Okay, is that? Am I cool with that? Um, what's the What's the future of this in five or ten years? Is it changing? Are there so many forks that I I don't want to have my art on this one, or is it an okay trade-off because there's a lot of liquidity in that market? So I have to decide what it is that I want. I think a lot of artists don't care; they just want to sell it really fast and get good turnover, but from a collector point of view, if I buy this thing, am I gonna have to update my node every year because it's like on the right Ethereum fork and then if I don't, then I have to decide like where are my tokens and all this. That's pretty complicated for an outside collector of this stuff. Right. So it's just trade-offs as far as, you know, what, what you want. Exactly. Yeah, I think there are like, so like using, you can like, you know, color coins on Bitcoin or something as far as like a property right or like ownership uh, indicator, like there are still questions about like, okay, what does Ethereum look like in two years and like how are the tokens going to migrate to these, uh, you know, this future that everybody's working on right now. Um, but it is a interesting point. Uh, and I can definitely see a, a scenario in where your tokens start gaining value and popularity but they are in a semi-centralized smart contract. Right. So you don't want an admin to post your tokens. So maybe you want to have at hand a protocol to make a public announcement perhaps and just freeze those tokens or, or, or burn them if possible and just recreate them in a, in a second uh, blockchain. So 
I think it's important to have. Yeah, yeah, because so there's so whenever there's side chains or whatever they're going to be called in in Ethereum, all these like you know Ethereum 2.0 things, shards and all this stuff, that's going to happen. There's going to be trade-offs. Some of those are going to be permissioned. And what if I'm in like a permission zone and I want to make Lubin Cash? But the people, the guardians of that side chain are all funded by Lube, then I might get censored. The same thing goes for a liquid network on, on Bitcoin. If I make a token on liquid network, uh, which you know has you know certain companies in it, and maybe if enough of them get together, theoretically they could censor my my token. Now, of course, that's really far fetched, but I mean, why are we doing all this stuff anyway, right? Why are we using a blockchain? Well, we're using a blockchain because it's, it's immutable, because you can do it permissionlessly. If, otherwise, if, it, if it doesn't matter to you, these things that we're talking about, well, then just use MySQL. <laughs> okay, I, guess, so I think, like, one point, though, is it's still much. We don't have that much, much time. Wrap oh, it up with that. Like, yeah, go ahead. Like, it is a more public data set, even if it is, like, semi permissioned, or, like, I think there's some. But benefit there just that like you'd have to like open up your MySQL like maintain an API versus like people can just index the smart contracts um, so it's a little different I think okay thank you and I have one uh, last opportunity here to speak um, and I want to talk to you James uh, James I invited you because you're a collector um, and I would want you to perhaps ask the panel as a collector something that you feel that you need to know from them, from maybe the technical side of things. What what would you like to know from from these smart guys who are behind the, the stuff that you're collecting? Um, so from the user experience, I would like, well, it's more suggestions than questions. Like, I would like to see uh, better options, for example, instead of having um, normal auctions, I would like to see, for example, reverse Dutch auctions, these kind of things. Uh, fract fractal ownership, for example. Um, sometimes I, something that, that is happening right now that you cannot see on the traditional art world is that I can do collaborations with artists. So, for example, I can send um, a whole list of instructions to an artist and then we tokenize that art and we divide uh, the, the revenue. Um, and right now we need to do all that manually and we know that with smart contract we can do most of this thing um, automatically, right? Um, and I would like to see these functions. Now, uh, when it comes to a question, I would like to ask the uh, super rare, like for example, what happens if your node goes down? Um, as a collective, if his node goes down, right? Because when I talk, when we tokenize art, Basically, what we do is that it gets uploaded to IPFS, right? But right now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, you guys are running the only super, no like the only super rare node. So what happens if that node goes offline? Does that mean that I don't have access to my collection? At least to, of course, I can access the metadata, but what about the image? If you guys disappear, um, if I'm not running my own node, where, where that art goes? Yeah, no, it's a super good question. I think like the on-chain art data topic is like pretty broad. Um, so right now we maintain a, a cluster of IPFS nodes, and so like right now if those all got blown away, um, it would be. I mean, we have like fallback and redundancy, but um, I mean it's still like definitely uh, a vulnerability. And so what we're working on is like a solution for people to be able to host all the data together. So it'd be like kind of just like a simple setup on top of IPFS. So if you want to join and run a redundant copy of everything, um, it's easy to do so. And let's say, because I'm deeply invested on, on Super Rare, like 90 plus percent of my art is tokenized on Super Rare. Um, as a collector, if I decide to run uh, a node, let's say, from Super Rare, is there any kind of, in, um, to incentivize, you know, if I want to do such a thing? Um, so yeah, right now that's all like R&D and experimentation, but yeah, I think that, uh, that would be part of the system. Okay, well thank you everybody. Before we leave, I want to remind you that we have the art gallery at the very entrance. Uh, we have all the works for auction. Uh, the proceeds uh, of these sales are going to go to the artists and to Room to Read, um, our partner for charity. Um, this year. 
Um, and we have tonight at the, at the uh, clock tower, downtown Denver, video mapping projections from the art, art, art and crypto community. It was an open call that hashtag art project, uh, the community that I'm running, artists and programmers. Um, we recruited a bunch of artists, we're video mapping the tower, so yes, this year art took over ETH Denver inside and outside. So thank you so much for being here.